Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so I wanted to uh, today to, to build on um, the uh, Edwards Jones uh, formula we, we introduced yesterday. Um, <clears throat> This time, uh, good. Okay, just sit down and shut up. <laughs> okay, I just recall the the uh, Edwards Jones. Formula. This is a formula that connects the uh, average density of eigenvalues for a generic random matrix uh, model with, with real eigenvalues. Uh, it is uh, a long expression, but in essence, um, it uh, amounts to the sokolsky plemage formula and a suitable representation of a sum of complex logarithms in terms of uh, an n-fold integral. So I write it in the full, in its full splendor. So we have a random matrix X. Let's assume it is real symmetric. We have a certain vector of dynamical variables y. Lambda epsilon is lambda, the location at which we, we want the spectral density, minus i epsilon. And uh, this uh, symbol here means average over the disorder. So it means that we are taking the average over the joint PDF of the entries of our matrix uh, X. And uh, this is the, <coughs> so this is the only input of the, of the formula. Now, yesterday we uh, <coughs> performed uh, this calculation for the GOE, uh, so ensemble of Gaussian real symmetric uh, matrices in the annealed uh, approximation. The annealed approximation means, in essence, that we are we are moving this logarithm outside of the of the average. So we are taking the logarithm of a multiple integral of dy and dx variables on the same on the same footing. Okay? This is clearly an approximation, but we showed yesterday that perhaps surprisingly, we landed on the correct uh, solution. So in the limit n to infinity, we landed on the semicircle law. Now, I wanted to, to show you now one possible way to uh, tackle this, this problem in the quenched version. So using exactly this formula without dirty tricks. I mean, with a series of dirty tricks, but less dirty than the one we saw yesterday. Okay? So uh, we, we do the calculation again for the, for the GOE, so we are expected to retrieve the semicircle again, but this time doing a full-fledged quenched calculation. So re remember that we can recall that the main, the main issue here is that if you look at this, this formula here, what we are after is the following multiple integral over the joint PDF of the entries times the logarithm of another multiple integral. So if we want to perform this integration, we need to find a way 
this time a legitimate way, so to speak, to get rid of this logarithm, which is right, right in the middle, right in the way. Because if, if we did carry out first the integration over y, then the logarithm, and then the integration over x, we would be just running the Edwards-Jones formula backwards, and we would just get a trivial identity, rho n of lambda equal to rho n of lambda. So the only way forward would be to try to exchange the order of integration and performing the average over the disorder first. Clearly, we cannot, we cannot do it, or at least not in an obvious way, because there is a logarithm in the way. OK? Is the, is the setting clear? OK, so for the GOE, I recall that the joint uh, PDF of the entries will be, OK, the diagonal entries. So it is just a product of Gaussian uh, variables uh, with different variants. I hope you all recall why we need different variants on the diagonal and off-diagonal terms. And on top of that, as, as we did yesterday, I rescaled the variance of the diagonal and off-diagonal uh, elements with, with n in order to, since we, we are expecting a good large n, large n limit. OK? So we don't, want, we don't want the edges of the semicircle to grow, to grow with n. OK, so what is the idea to get uh, to get rid of the logarithm. This is a beautiful beautiful and elegant uh, construction full of mathematical problems, but can I, can I remove this? It's too late anyway. Okay? Good. Okay, so the idea to get rid of the logarithm in between is the so-called replica identity, sometimes referred to as the replica trick. So the replica identity is uh, based on the following uh, identity. So what we want is the average of log of z to the lambda, uh, of z of, of lambda, sorry. So this is the object that we are after, the average of log of z of lambda. And we write this object as limit n to 0, 1 over n logarithm of the average of z to the n of lambda. OK? So limit n to 0, 1 over n, logarithm of the average of z to the n of lambda. Uh, how to prove uh, this? Well, what you do is you write z to the n of lambda as exponential of n log z of lambda. Just write it in exponential form. And then you expand this exponential as 1 plus n log z of lambda plus orders of n square. And then you average term by term. So you get that the average of z n of lambda will be the average of 1, which is 1, plus n into the average of log z of lambda plus orders of n square. Then you take the logarithm on both sides. So logarithm of the average of z n of lambda. So you get logarithm of 1 plus something small. And log of 1 plus something small is, asymptotically for n to, to 0, something small. So this object here is n average of log z of lambda. 
so if you divide by n and send n to zero, which is the limit in which we, we are killing these extra terms, then you get your identity. Yeah. yeah. No, the, so far, I mean, we are just gearing up. So so far, so far, everything is sort of okay. Okay, but don't worry, the dirt will come. So, so so far we are on, on some sort of clean grounds. Okay. So now look, look, stare carefully at this uh, identity. You will encounter it uh, probably many times, maybe even this afternoon or in in future uh, courses. Uh, what is the advantage? Let's let's think about it. What is the advantage of this formula? So here on the left hand side we have the average of a logarithm that we don't know how to perform. On the other si side, the average has been moved inside the argument of the logarithm. So the, the logarithm is somehow out of the way. So it is not inside the average anymore. And on top of that, z of lambda is raised to some power n. Now, we want to evaluate this expression in the vicinity of n to 0. Okay, so for real values that are close to zero. But suppose for a mo moment that this limit was, was not there, then we could interpret this object for small n integer as z of lambda replicated n times. That's, that's the, the, the reason why the, uh, this trick is called the replica identity. So we are replicating z of lambda n times. And if n, little n, not capital N, capital N is the size of the matrix. If little n is an integer, then we are replicating a multiple integral little n times. Okay? But a multiple integral replicated little n times has a very nice property that it is still a multiple integral, just a larger one. Right? The reason is that if you have an integral dx of phi of x to the power 2, well, you can write this one as integral of dx dy phi of x phi of y. Right? So if you have, if you have an integral raised to some power, this is another integral, just in, in an enlarged number of variables. And this here is the core of of the method. So we, we got rid of the, of the logarithm, and we get a replicated uh, version of our multiple integral. Let's see how this works in, in practice. So what we, of course, here the, the tricks, the mathematical proper problems start to, to appear, because if we promote this little n to be an integer, which is what we need to do, uh, then we will need to make sure that this limit is well, well defined. Okay. Because the smallest n that we have is 1, which is very far from 0. Right? So we, we are sitting here, but somehow we need to analytically continue the result in the vicinity of 0, of n equal to 0, at the end of the calculation. If this can be done, then we might be on safe, on safe grounds. So how does this uh, work in practice? All we have to do is now replicate z of lambda, which is this object here, little n times. <coughs> Let's do it. So what is the average of z to the power n of lambda. Well, we have the average. So we are averaging over the disorder. So we are averaging over the entries of our random matrix, which are Gaussian random variables. So this is the average part.
Okay. So here's the average part over the disorder. And now we need to include this object, which is Z of lambda, replicated little n times. So here we will have an integral which runs over what? So if this integral runs over R to the capital N, this integral will run over R to the capital N times little n. Because we have the integral that we had before replicated little n times. Now, this vector here will become a, a replicated vector. So and let's call the replica indices with the name A. So here we have a vector Y which will now carry an additional index A, an additional replica index. Okay? So all I'm, all I'm doing is I'm applying this, this rule here, except that instead of having 2, I'm having N. So here we will have that this is dx1, well, let's call it uh, xi, so we, we are not in trouble. <coughs> so I'm just applying d xi1, d xi little n, phi of xi1, phi of xi n. This is all I'm doing here. OK, so then I need to replicate this object here. So I write it explicitly. So this will be the exponential of minus i over 2. And then written explicitly, this reads summation over i and j, which runs from 1 to n. And then we will have a summation over the replica indices a1 to little n, y i a, lambda epsilon delta i j minus x i j, y j a. So this object here is just the extended version of this product of matrix times vector times vector replicated little n times. So the, the logarithm has disappeared. Our multiple integral, which initially ran over capital N variables, now runs over capital N times little n variables. Okay? And we replicated it. At this stage, little n is an integer. Do we all agree? Now, what is the advantage of this expression here with respect to the initial one? That's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole point of why we are doing this, right? Yeah, we took the logarithm out, but this was just instrumental to doing what? So we wanted to take the logarithm out. Why? Because we wanted to swap the order of the integrations and do the integral over the disorder, the average over the disorder first. And now we can do it, right? Because we can swap this integral and this integral and do the integral over x first, which we couldn't do before. Okay. Now, if you understand this, then everything goes smoothly. It's absolutely, you know, it, it is important that it is absolutely crystal, crystal clear to you why we are doing that. The logarithm is out of the way. Now we can swap the order of integration and do the integral over x first. Okay? If, if we keep it like this, we don't have any advantage in, in doing the, the replica trick if, if we do the y integral first. That's exactly identical of what we had before. But now we can swap the integrals because the logarithm is no longer in the way. Clear? Well, I hope it is. So what we have to do now is we exchange the order of integrations and do the average over the disorder first. Okay, 
So the replicated partition function will now be equal to what? We exchange the order of integration. So this integral becomes the outer integral, product a1 to n. The y, where y is a vector, which now carries an additional uh, index a. And then we have exponential, a, a bit, we have a bit that does not depend on the disorder, which is the, this bit here, the diagonal bit. So we can pull it out. So we have exponential of what? Of minus i over 2 lambda epsilon summation i 1 to n summation a from 1 to little n of what? Of y i a square. So this bit is just the diagonal bit here. And now the remaining bit depends on the disorder. So we need first to, to include the integral over the x. So now we have an integral over the diagonal bit, which is and then we have the Gaussian distribution of our diagonal entries, and then we have, which, which was this bit here, and then we, we have the diagonal bit corresponding to this, to this term. So this is plus i over 2 summation over i, summation of, uh, let's say, x i i, and then we have a summation over a of y i a squared, which is the diagonal term here. So we get a minus and a minus, which is a plus, i over 2, and then we have x i i that multiplies y i a, y i a. So it is y i a squared. And now we have the off diagonal bit. So we have so j the x i j root pi over n, and then we have exponential of minus n summation over i smaller than j of x i j square, which is this term here, <coughs> and then we have the remaining off diagonal bit there summation i smaller than j, summation a from 1 to n of y i a x i j y j a. So now we are making progress, right? Why? Because what, what type of integrals we have here? So we have Gaussian integrals, well, which are, which we don't have mean zero, but still, you know, they are Gaussian, Gaussian integrals. And here we have Gaussian integrals as well. Right. So all we have to do now is we have to perform these Gaussian integrals, these Gaussian integrals, and then the results will depend on the vectors y. And then we will have to perform this integration over y. Okay. Good. So we can perform now the, um, we can perform the Gaussian integrals using the uh, identity that I 
showed you before, uh, yesterday. So integral minus infinity to plus infinity dq of exponential of minus alpha q square plus i gamma q is proportional. So from now on, I will not keep in track of all the proportionality constants. Anyway, we will need to, to send gamma to, uh, to send n to infinity, so these are not, not important. Okay, so this, this type of structure is exactly the object that we have here and here. And we have just multiple copies of, of Gaussian integrals. Good, so we can use this identity uh, repeatedly with uh, alpha equal to what? Well, it will be e equal to uh, n over 2 if, if we are in this situation, or n if we are using this to kill these integrals. And uh, what is gamma? So gamma will be uh, one half summation over a y a a i a square, or gamma equal to summation over a y i a y j a. If we are in that situation, so I'm just reading off the values of alpha and gamma so that each of these integrals can be performed. And then these are just n copies, you know, capital N copies of the same Gaussian integral. <coughs> Do we agree on that? So if you, if you look at this formula, what, what are we expecting to see? That the result of this integration and the result of this integration will involve a term of the type exponential of minus some summation over replicas to the power 2, right? So this is what, what we expect to obtain. So if we do, if we just apply these, these two formulas, I'll just give you the, the result. We have that the replicated partition function, so z and of lambda, is equal to what? It is an integral over r capital N times N of product over A, the y vector with an index A, and then what? Exponential of minus i lambda epsilon over 2 summation i 1 to capital N summation A from 1 to small n of y i a square, which was this term here. And then the result of, of these n-fold uh, Gaussian integrals. So we, we will have minus 1 over 8 times n which comes from here, 4 times n. <coughs> summation i1 to n, summation a y i a square, all to the power square. This is the first term. And then we have another term, the diagonal one. And then the off-diagonal one, which is summation i smaller than j, of what? Summation over a, y i a, y j a square. So this is the gamma for the first integral, for the first type of integrals. And this is the gamma for the second type of integrals that are all raised to the square, and then we have a summation over i, and a summation over i different from uh, smaller than j, just because these are different copies of the same Gaussian integral. <coughs> OK, 
Okay. So uh, now what we uh, what, what we would like to do, well, this is not really uh, an equal, but let's say roughly equal because uh, I am discarding all the constant in, in front. Okay. Now, if you, if you look at this expression, we would like now to perform this uh, integration over the y uh, variables, but these integrations are, are nasty because due to these uh, squares here, Basically, we are, <coughs> we are coupling integration variables that belong to different sides, i and j. Okay. So we would need to find a way to decouple the, um, the sides so that we, we, we can carry out this uh, integration. So one way, uh, so first of all, let me simplify. So this, these two terms uh, here can be grouped into a single term, which is minus 1 over uh, 8n summation i and j. So we are now summing over all uh, possible pairs of summation over a, uh, y i a, y j a square. Oops. Yeah, so these two terms can be lumped uh, together into a single, uh, single term. And now, to uh, proceed further, I will introduce a trick. Um, so this is not the, the standard way people use to, to do the, the, the coupling, but I thought I would use this, uh, this other way because it is more I mean, uh, it is somehow more uh, modern, and it has applications beyond this case, so I thought it would be good to, to show it to you. So we uh, introduce the following <coughs> normalized uh, density which we called mu. So mu will be a function of a vector y. And this vector stands for a vector y1, y2, y little n. So this vector has a size which is equal to the number of replicas, little n. So I will denote uh, vectors that are of this of this form, with with a, with an arrow, and uh, instead this vector here is of size capital N. So I will denote it with a bold face um, uh, font. Okay. So the definition of this object is. So I first give the definition, and then I'll try to explain why this object is useful. 1 over n, summation i from 1 to n, product a from 1 to little n, delta of y a minus y i a. So this, this structure uh, resembles a lot the standard structure for the, for the density, for example, of, of eigenvalues, 1 over n summation over uh, i, for example, in the case of the eigenvalues, and then we would have just the delta, delta terms. But this time, this object is replicated little n, little n times. So why am I doing this? Well, uh, I'm doing this because if we introduce this definition, then uh, okay, let me write it here. <coughs> then you can show that this term here can be written using this density in a quite convenient form. So minus 1 over 8n summation i and j of the summation over a, y i a y j a square. So this term to be 
prove it can be written as minus n over 8 integral over dy dw mu of y mu of w summation over a w a y a square Y, y a so here is an object that has only one in one index y a which corresponds to the to the entries of this vector and here we have the same object but coupled to a site so which is assigned to the site i the site over which we are summing so over a we are taking the product over i we are summing and the reason why we are taking this, this definition is just, and I ask you to, to check this yourself, plug, plug this definition here, so mu of y and mu of w in here, and use the property of the delta function just to show that this right-hand side is coming out exactly as the left-hand side here, which is the object we have in the exponential. Okay, so we can trade this summation here for an integral over these vector fields. You can, you can see it uh, already because this mu will carry uh, a factor one, 1 over n here. So you will get a factor 1 over n from here, 1 over n from here. So 1 over n squared, which multiplied by n, will reproduce the factor 1 over n that you have here. For example, yeah. No, it is. Uh, it is not. It is not preferred. Actually, it is longer. The the way I'm doing it. Uh, the The problem is that the Hubbard Stratonovich is specific for the GOE, or, or when you have a Gaussian measure. Instead, this trick this trick is more general. So, so you can use it also for ensembles that we were, you, you don't you don't have a Gaussian integral to play with. For example, we will use this, this trick in the next lecture when we are dealing with, with like random, random graphs or sparse matrices. So I, I just prefer to, to do it in, in one go. It is actually a longer route. If you, if you have a Gaussian measure, you can, it is quicker to do, to do the upper Stratonovich. <coughs> okay? Do we agree on this? Okay, so um, now probably uh, we have seen this, this type of tricks uh, before, so you probably know where, like where I'm uh, heading. So what I want to do is to replace this uh, finite summation with integrals in the exponential uh, here. And the multiple integral here, I would probably like to replace it with a functional integral over densities. Okay? We have seen this trick before. So now you know what I need to do is I need to enforce this definition using a proper delta function, right? So that I can trade this multiple integral for a functional uh, integration, and I will have a term that resembles an entropy. This we have seen exactly the same trick in the context of the Coulomb gas analogy. So let's do it step by step. We have this identity, so now I want to keep uh, this one. I would like to keep that one. Do we have another blackboard? Um, okay. No, I will have to uh, copy it again. Too bad. Good, so you have everything in your notes. Good, so 
We want to enforce the definition of our mu. So I recall that mu <coughs> No, I don't recall what mu is. It's too long. You know what it is. So now we introduce the same uh, representation of the identity that we used in the past for the Coulomb gas uh, analogy. So we are basically enforcing the definition of the density which is n mu of y minus 1 over n summation i1 to n product over a from 1 to n delta of y a minus y i a. Okay, so this is basically the um, definition of our density mu of y. And this object here is basically a functional analog of the standard you know, Fourier representation of the delta function. Okay. Normally for a, for a standard uh, delta function delta of x, you, you could write this one in this form. And this, this object is basically the functional analog of, this, of the Fourier representation for a standard delta function. So what I'm doing is I'm enforcing the definition of mu of y, which is this one, using this, basically. Okay. So this uh, entails, so this mu hat is a conjugate field, which is exactly the equivalent, the, the, you know, it plays the role of k in this Fourier representation. Okay? So if we do that, we can introduce this representation of unity in, in, inside this integral. So we, we have that Zn of lambda can be now represented as a functional integral over mu, the density mu, and the conjugate density mu hat. Then we have a term that is what? Minus i n mu times mu hat. So minus i n integral dy mu of y mu hat of y. <coughs> this term here. Then we have this term here that we could represent in terms of the density this way. So we get minus n over 8 integral dy dw mu of y, mu of w, and then we have summation over a, y a, w a square. And then what remains is what? Is this bit here that we haven't used yet. So the integral over dy a that is still there. This bit and this bit. Agree? So these are the two bits that we haven't used yet. So integral d mu d mu at times the integral over product over a dy a of what? Of exponential minus i lambda epsilon over 2 summation over i 1 to n summation over a from 1 to n y i a square plus i summation i 1 to n integral d y mu hat of y product over a 
delta of y a minus y i a. So my replicated partition function is now expressed in terms of uh, functional integrals over some fields, which are mu and mu and mu hat, which are defined over vectors of size little n, the number of replicas. And then we have this first term, which comes from this definition. The second term comes from the fact that this term can be written in terms of, the, of these densities. And then we have the leftovers, this object here and this object here. Oh yeah, this one. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, because I, I I put the I put the n here. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. So what's what's next? So first of all, I wanted to draw your attention on the fact that here, you see that thanks to to this uh, trick, we have a capital N that is popping up in front of these two integrals. And we know that when we have a functional integral of exponential of n times something, this smells good. Why? Yeah, so what we are, what we are uh, heading towards is the, the possibility of applying a subtle point evaluation to this functional, to this functional integral, right? So here, the, the fact that n is cropping up in this, uh, in this way, so in front of, of an action, if you want, is, a, is good news. Okay, so what's, what's next? Now we can, uh, we can try to uh, compute this uh, multiple integral first, and then we will have our action that we can evaluate with the subtle, in a subtle point approximation. So the, what remains to be done is Let's compute the n-fold uh, integral below. And then we make a break. So what we have is the integral over r capital N times N of product over A d y A, which is this object here. Is everything all right? OK, so you see, now just help me out uh, on this, here, in this multiple integral, we have summation over i from 1 to n and summation over i from 1 to n in the exponential. So this smells good, right? So we have a multiple, multiple integral of exponential of the sum of terms. So what is this? This is just n, capital N copies of a single integral, right? Because we could put the sum, summation in front as a product. So this is just an n copies, capital N copies, of a single integral. Single meaning that does, does not depend on capital N anymore. It, is still depend, it still depends on little n replicas. So this object here is something raised to the power capital N of what? Of an integral which now runs over r to the little n. Let's call it dy1, the integration variable. So this is a, a, a vector of size uh, little n. And then we have exponential of minus i over 2. All I have to do is to kill 
these summations. Okay. So exponential i over 2 lambda epsilon <coughs> summation a 1 to n of y 1 a square plus i integral over dy mu hat of y product over a delta of y a minus y 1 a. So all I'm all I'm doing is I'm I'm picking one representative out of this out of this product that I call y one. All of this is raised to the power n capital N because we have capital N copies of a single integral, and then I'm killing these summations. Okay. Well, and then this smells very good. <clears throat> so we have integral over r to the n dy1 of what? Of exponential minus i over 2 lambda epsilon summation over a y1a square. And then I can use this, these delta functions to kill these uh, integral. Right? Because I have exactly little n delta functions that are killing this multiple integral. So what remains here is plus i mu hat of the vector y1. <clears throat> and then one, once this is done, I can also rename this object as just <coughs> as just y instead of y1 and we are done now why is this uh, good again so we have solved this uh, this integral sort of clearly we, we still have a dependence on uh, on the uh, you know auxiliary function mu mu hat the conjugate field but this is good because we can write this object as exponential to the power n logarithm of something, of this, of this integral. And exponential of capital N is exactly what we want. Why? Because we can now replace exponential of n times something into here. And so we will have exponential of n times into an action. And this is, this is very good. This is what we wanted. OK, so I think we can make uh, a good uh, 6 minutes and 48 seconds break. <laughs> you can go. OK. Uh, <clears throat> is over. <clears throat> Are we ready? Good. OK, <clears throat> so we computed sort of, uh, at least in terms of this uh, conjugate um, function, uh, this uh, multiple integral. And we showed that we could uh, write it as <clears throat> exponential of n times the logarithm of, of something of this integral here. Um, <clears throat> so we can replace this uh, result in here because we have exponential of n into something. So I can just erase this object here. Uh, erase this uh, bracket here. And <clears throat> let's write here plus 
n <coughs> times the logarithm of this of this integral. Okay, <clears throat> so now we are sort of in business because this object here can now be written as a functional integral over the density mu, functional integral over the conjugate density mu hat of exponential of n into <clears throat> some action which depends on the replica index little n. And this action is a function of mu, mu hat, and parametrically of lambda or lambda epsilon, if you want. So what is this, <coughs> what is this action S n? So it is minus i integral dy <coughs> mu of y mu hat <coughs> of y. Then we have this term here. <coughs> minus 1 over 8 integral dy dw mu of y mu of w summation over a w a y a all squared can you can you read here either yes or no plus logarithm of integral over r to the power n dy exponential uh, minus i uh, alpha lambda epsilon summation over a y a squared <coughs> plus i mu hat of y So we have that our replicated partition function can be written in terms of a functional integral of exponential into n times an action. This action depends on the replica index that at, at this stage is still an integer. Remember, we replicated the partition function little n integer times. So little n is hidden in the fact that the component of these vectors are n-dimensionals. And the action is formed of three, uh, three pieces, three chunks. One is a function of mu and mu hat. One is a function of mu alone, but couples different vectors. And the other one is a function of mu hat, mu hat alone. Okay. Now, this, <clears throat> this type of uh, uh, expression clearly uh, lends uh, itself to a nice um, subtle point approximation. I have to, to warn you, though, that uh, at, this, at this stage, the, the math becomes <coughs> uh, a bit esoteric. So what I, what I mean is that if you, rem if you recall how the Edward Jones uh, formula with the replica uh, trick involved was, was defined, we had replaced the... Um, we had the derivative with respect of lambda, imaginary part, blah, blah, and we replaced the logarithm of z to the lambda with what? With a limit n to 0 of 1 over n log of z n of lambda. Okay? So technically speaking, what we, should, what we should do at this point is to take the replica limit to 0 first. So that's that's what we should do. The problem is that we cannot do it at this, at this point before taking the capital N to infinity first, because we don't have a way to evaluate this integral for, for an N that is not equal to infinity, so to speak. 
So what we are effectively doing is we are exchanging the order of limits. So we are sending capital N to infinity before sending little n to zero. Okay? And at this point, we just need to close our eyes and hope for the best. Okay? So luckily, the best will come. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting my time here. But uh, strictly speaking, we are, we are like on, on, on pretty shaky, shaky grounds at this stage. Good. Let's close our eyes. So now you tell me what, what I have to do here for capital N to infinity. No excuses. You had your coffee. What do I have to do? So the point, so it means. So this, this object is a function of mu and mu hat. So what I should do is to find the critical points of this of this action, right? So it's to find the points at which the function of the yeah. The functional derivative of S n with respect to mu and the functional derivative of S n with respect to mu hat are both set to zero. So if we differentiate Sn with respect to mu first, so here we differentiate with respect to mu, so I get minus i mu hat, and let's call it mu hat star, because this is the, the optimal solution to this uh, set of equation. And then mu appears also here, but not, but not here. And here it appears two times, so I need to multiply this object by two and change sign. So I get one over four integral over dw mu star of w summation over a y a w a all square. So this is my first uh, equation. So minus i mu hat star is equal to an integral over mu star. And then instead, the second condition here will give, if I differentiate with respect to mu hat, we have minus i mu star and then we need to differentiate this object with respect to mu hat because mu hat appears here so if i differentiate this uh, the logarithm this object goes downstairs so i get integral over r to the n dy Let's call it dy prime exponential minus i over 2 lambda epsilon summation over a y a prime square plus i mu hat star of y prime. So this mu hat star. So this, this bit is just the fact that I'm differentiating with respect to mu hat. So this object goes downstairs. And then upstairs, I still need to, to do the differentiation. So I get the exponential minus i over 2 lambda epsilon summation over a of y a, uh, y a square plus i mu hat star of y multiplied by minus i, which is this this term here brought to the to the right to the right hand side. So I can erase this minus i and this minus i. And so we have the, the set of coupled integral equation for the densities mu hat star and mu and mu stars. So these are the, the subtle point the subtle point equations. 
Now the 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 point is how do we solve uh, how do we solve this system of two coupled integral equations for a scalar function of n-dimensional vectors. Okay, good luck. So the uh, the good thing is that uh, we can now plug um, <coughs> this equation inside. So the second equation inside the first. So we can at least reduce the two equations to a single equation for one of the two objects. So if uh, if we do that, so if we plug the second equation into the um, the first. Okay, so combining the two, so I'll try to write it as big as I can, so we get minus i mu hat star of y, which is this object here, is equal to so we have a denominator, which is integral over the w hat exponential minus i over 2 lambda epsilon summation over a of w a squared. So I'm just changing names y prime into w plus i mu hat star of w downstairs. So now this single equation will only be uh, involving mu hat star. Okay. So we have we are combining the two equations into a single single one. Upstairs we have a factor one over one over four, and then we have the integral over the w exponential of minus i lambda epsilon over 2 summation over a w a squared plus i mu hat star of w times times what times this bit here and this bit here, I can rewrite it as a sca scalar product, as a dot product of y and w. So I have now the dot product of y and w squared. Okay. So I have combined. So here, you have y, the vector of little n uh, variables, and y appears here, you see? And then w is the integration, is the integration variable. If I only had another color, yes, I do. And w, well, upstairs and downstairs, are the integration the integration variables. OK? So now I, I should solve this integral equation for the function mu hat star, which appears here and inside an integration in n-dimensional coordinates. So. These are n-dimensional integrals. Good. So how do we how do we solve it? Well, first of all, we we have to make 
some assumption on the behavior of mu hat of y. So the, the assumption that is made at this, uh, at this point is that <coughs> is that mu hat and mu star of y will be just a function of the modulus of y. So this is the so-called replica symmetric and high temperature So this is an assumption or, or um, an answer that needs to be verified afterwards. It means, it, but it cannot be verified. We can only just do this, use it, and then try to land on the correct, on the correct answer. The idea behind, uh, behind it is that, well, replica symmetric, you know the replicas, y1, y2, yn, were introduced as a mathematical trick to be able to exchange the order of, of integrations. Okay? So if we, when we, we did that, there was, at the beginning, no reason to assume that any replica would be different or should be different from any other. Right? So the idea that y1, so the first component of, of the vector, and y17 should be different or should play a different role in, in the following, uh, does, would, would not come from, from anywhere in this, in this derivation. All the copies, all the replicas, should be treated as, as equal. So it is quite normal or intuitive to assume that this object at least should have some uh, symmetry under permutations of, of replicas, under exchange of, of replica labels, if you want. Clearly, uh, as probably Federico will uh, We'll discuss uh, a lot about about this. The situation is not uh, is not so simple. So, we now know that this uh, simple-minded argument might not work, or at least might not work uh, everywhere, and for all for all models. And this gives rise to the whole business of replica symmetry breaking, uh, which some of you might might have heard, and I think Federico will will uh, cover in uh, in his lectures. So, so far, let's treat this as, as an ansatz. We assume that mu star hat of y vector is only a function of the modulus of this, of this vector, because this simplifies the analysis considerably. OK. So um, what, we, what we do here is we assume that this object is now a function of a scalar variable, which is just y. Let's say, let's call y the modulus of, of the vector y in replica space. But still, here on the right hand side, we have n dimensional uh, integrals. Okay? So now you tell me what uh, I should do with, with these integrals if we assume that the integrand is only a function of the modulus. What, what would you do? If, if, if we were in two dimensions, what would you do? Yes. So you would, you would go to polar coordinates, or in this situation, you would go to spherical and dimensional coordinates, right? Because the integrand only depends on the modulus. Okay. Now, have you ever used spherical and dimensional coordinates? Yeah, but they are not, they are not, they are not very nice, but you can still, you know, it is just a generalization of polar coordinates to n, uh, n dimensions. So, <coughs> so they were discovered by Mr. Wikipedia. 
Well, at least I took, I took them from, from him. So for example, well, maybe I should erase this. We are, I'm recorded. <laughs> Sorry? Why master Wikipedia? Well, because it's why, why it because I have I, I have I have too much respect for women. <laughs> Good. So this is the list of n-dimensional spherical coordinates in terms of a certain number of angles and the modulus of and the modulus of the vector. Okay? Which is y in this situation, we call it y there. Okay, so who knows the um, volume element? in, in n-dimensional spherical coordinates. So in two dimensions, we know what the volume element is, right? If you want the Jacobian of the change of variables. I thought we knew. So we've got variables r and theta. So what is the Jacobian of the change of variables? R square. So, so what, is the, what is the volume element? One. Any other options? <laughs> Let's open a poll. I, I knew it was r. Right? <laughs> Maybe, is it correct? Maybe. Okay, so what is the generalization of this stuff to n-dimensional coordinates? R to the power of eight minus yes? No idea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> me, <laughs> me neither before Mr. <laughs> helped me. So r to the n minus 1 times sine to the n minus 2 phi 1 so down to sine phi n minus 2. So, well, in, let's give another one. Sine n minus 3 phi 2 down to sine phi n minus 2. Okay? And if n is equal to 2, then you get r here, and all these cancel. Okay. So, of course, this is that's valid only for, yeah. Good. So, what I need to do now is go to uh, spherical coordinates upstairs, go to spherical coordinates downstairs, and then possibly cancel out terms that are common to the numerator and denominator. Of course, here, you will have a lot of uh, angular integral in the, in the numerator. The integrand here does not depend on angles at all. Here, it depends on how many angles? One. Just one, right? It depends on the angle between y and w. So it means that a lot of, integral, a lot of angular integrals will cancel out between numerator <coughs> and denominator. Only one angular integral will remain upstairs and downstairs because there is a remaining angle here that we take as the angle between the vector y and w. Okay? So this simplifies things a lot because we can cancel out a lot of integrals between upstairs and downstairs. Now, if we do that, what remains, I, I just write, you, write the, um, the result. So the final result will be minus i mu hat star of y. Good. 
So down, let's start downstairs. Downstairs we have an integral over the radius, which is 0 to infinity, d omega. Then we have the radius, which is omega to the n minus 1. Exponential of minus i over 2 lambda epsilon omega square plus i mu hat star of omega times so this this bit should be should be clear we have the radial coordinates which with with the jacobian which is the radial coordinates to the n minus 1 and the radial coordinates goes from 0 to infinity the integral only depends on the radial on the radial coordinates so it is omega square and omega is the argument of mu hat star and then there is one remaining angular integral, which is the one that hasn't cancelled out between down, upstairs and downstairs. So here we have, for example, integral between 0 and pi, d phi, uh, sine of phi to the power n minus 2. Yeah. Which is the only uh, angular integral that remains uh, and, and so we will need to use this, this one upstairs as well. So upstairs what we have? We have the same thing. So d omega. So first of all we have 1 over 4. Then we have y square. So we have y square, omega square, and then the cosine of the angle between y and, and omega, or and w. So we have y square over 4 in front. Then we have d omega, omega to the n minus 1, exponential of minus i over 2 lambda epsilon omega square plus i mu hat star of omega. Then we have omega square, which comes from here. Well, omega on w, I call them, yeah, whatever, w square. And then the cosine of the, of the 2. So we have sine phi to the n minus 2 times cos phi squared. Sorry? So, so there is, there is y, this, this is y square, w square. No, because uh, y, so this, this object here is y times, so it is y times w times the cosine of the angle between, in between them. So if you, if you, if you square here and here, you get y square, w square, and cosine square. Right? Yeah, so the, the y square is here with, with a factor 1 over 4. Uh, is this fine? And, and, and this object here is just the radial, the Jacobian, the radial part of the Jacobian. Okay. <coughs> Now, maybe you are not appreciating it at, uh, at this moment, but look what's, what's happening here. So very swiftly, we have turned our little n, which was an integer, into a real variable. Right? So at this, at this point, this, this expression does not, no longer know that little n is an integer which is a very good thing, right? Because we, we don't want n, little n, in the end to be an integer. Because we want, in the end, to take the limit little n to 0. Okay. So very swiftly, by using this, this ansatz, the little n is now appearing as a parameter inside the, the equation, so it is no longer an integer. Do you agree? Yeah. Integer. 
Yes. And then you're changing the things. Yes. Like yes. So the well, the only the only way to to check this is that it it gives the correct result in the end. Well, in the case of GOE, we know the results, right? Because applying the Edwards-Jones using all these tricks, we know that we should land on a semicircle, right? For, for other type of uh, random matrix models, you can check with numerical simulations, for example. And it also, it also works. If you're asking for a theorem, well, you know, then you would, you would need to ask ask this to a mathematician with a lot of, um, well, how, how shall I say, in a, in a way that is. So mathematicians would be horrified by all I've done, and they would have stopped listening to me much earlier than, than this stage. OK? So just, um, just to, be, to be clear. Even though now there are a lot, of, to, be, to be fair, there are a lot of mathematicians that are trying to make replicas rigorous. And then they will claim that they have done it. Yeah. How do you know that the sine to n minus two remains not to n minus three or? No, I mean, well, you are you are just picking one. You are just picking one of the angles. Okay. Right. The important thing is that you pick the same angle upstairs and downstairs. No, no, there is, there is, in principle, there is, there is no difference. This, this one just makes the calculation a little bit uh, easier, not, not so much. The, the, the important thing is that you pick the same angle between upstairs and downstairs. You, you cannot pick a different power of n in, in the two, otherwise you're picking two different angles. Okay? In the end, in the end nothing will, will change. The, the common contribution will, will, will cancel out upstairs and downstairs. Actually, we can compute now these integrals explicitly, because we know, we know the explicit expression for these integrals. So, so you can just, you know, if, if you, so there are formulas for, for these integrals. So sine of phi uh, to the power n minus 2 cos square of phi. So these expressions are in terms of gamma, gamma function. And downstairs, so we can we can compute uh, these two integrals uh, explicitly. And then there is uh, another good, uh, good thing, maybe you haven't, uh, you haven't noticed uh, it, that just for the Gaussian uh, ensemble, an incredible simplification has, has happened, which is that this function becomes just equal to y square into a constant. You will not see it from, from here, but you will see it in, in a minute. So y squared, the, the only dependence on y now is, is here, right? is in front. So what, whatever mu star, mu hat star is, once you plug it in, in here and you solve the integrals, this will be just numbers. So the only dependence on y is this y, y squared in front. This is just a feature of the Gaussian, of the Gaussian ensemble. Okay? It is not a general feature. It is very nice. So, so we know that exactly mu star will be a constant, whatever it is, times y, y square. Good. So if we, if we call this object, just to simplify notation, uh, g, so g of, g of w, 
we call it as exponential minus i over 2 lambda epsilon w square plus i mu hat star of w. Then we can uh, rewrite this by pulling out uh, a factor, a minus sign. So we have i mu hat star of y is equal to, let's simplify things between upstairs and downstairs. So we will get gamma n alpha times n divided by 2 gamma of 1 plus n alpha. times y square over 4, which is this object here, times what? Upstairs we have integral between 0 and infinity of dw, w to the power n plus 1, because we have n minus 1 plus 2 of g of omega. And downstairs we have integral n minus 1 g of omega. Okay. So whatever mu star is, these two objects are just numbers. So we, we know that the only dependence that mu star hat can have on y is of the type y square into a constant. There is a second observation to be made here, at least from the point of view of the uh, prefactor, this object has a, good, uh, has a good limit as little n goes to zero. So it has a finite, it has a finite limit as little n goes to zero. Okay? So here at this stage you, you don't see any more, so the integer nature of little n has completely faded, faded out. So actually, in the limit little n to 0, this object will go to 1. Here, uh, I can, sorry, I, here there should be a minus uh, sign in front, but I will trade this minus sign by doing a trick here. So if I do a, an integration by part here, I can rewrite this object as g prime of omega. <coughs> and there is a minus sign that will cancel out this minus, minus sign in front. So actually, this is the correct final formula. Uh, can, you, can you see there is, a, there is a prime here? So can you, can you see why I'm doing an integration by, by parts here? why it is, it is convenient to do an integration by parts and lift a power of n instead of having n minus 1 to have just a power of n here. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, because uh, in the end we are interested in the limit little n to 0. Okay. So if I had an n minus 1 here taking the limit directly inside here would cause a problem, like a non-integrable, a possible non-integrable divergence of the type one over one over w at at zero, or well, I mean, and anywhere, but in particular at zero. Okay. Instead, by 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 doing an integration by part, I am I, on a bit on on safer grounds. So I could, in principle, pull a little n to zero without, without thinking too much. OK, so uh, in essence, what we, what we have here is we can write, we can write i mu hat star of y is a certain constant which depends on lambda into y square. And uh, this constant which depends on lambda, we can, uh, we can determine 
we can determine it self-consistently. So what is the equation satisfied by So C of lambda, so limit n to 0 assumed, so C of lambda, which is this object here, should be equal to this, to whatever multiplies y square on this side. So we know that this object goes to 1, so C of lambda should, should be equal to 1 over 4 integral between 0 and infinity, the omega of omega g of omega, integral between 0 and infinity, the omega g prime of omega. And for example, upstairs, you will have integral 0 to infinity, the omega omega. Remember what g of omega was, exponential of minus i over 2 lambda epsilon omega square plus what we had. We had i omega star in here. But we know that i mu, uh, sorry, i mu star, mu hat star. But we know that this object is equal to c of lambda omega square. And similarly, well, if you want, you can treat this as a total derivative or you can do the, the differentiation. But the point is that you have C of lambda here and C of lambda inside integrals here. And these integrals, you can perform them explicitly because they are of the form exponential of minus something into omega square, eventually multiplied by, by an omega. So these integrals, you can carry, you can carry them out explicitly. You see? Hmm. OK. So you remember what g of omega was. So g of omega was defined in this way. But now we know that i mu hat star of omega has this form here. So i mu hat star of omega is c of lambda, a certain constant, into omega square or w square, right? So we can just plug this object here into the definition of g of w. And now we have that e mu hat star of y is this object times y square times this, this, this object here. So this object times this object in the limit n to 0 should be equal to c of lambda. So this gives a self-consistency self equation for C of lambda. So C of lambda must be equal to 1 over 4 into the ratio of these two integrals, where in the integrand we are using the fact that i mu hat star as a function of y is quadratic. So this is an equation. This is effectively an equation for C of lambda. Because, because these integrals, now we can perform them explicitly. It's exponential of minus on w square into something times w. And here we have just the derivative of it, if you want. So you get explicit expressions. It's a, it's a number. On the right-hand side, we have a number that depends on, on c of lambda. So you can just solve this equation. So if you, if you solve this equation, um, where is it? So if you, solve, if you solve the equation for C of lambda, which I leave it uh, to you, what you obtain is I lambda epsilon And again, 
what you're witnessing here is once again the birth of a semicircle. So, so the, the, the semicircle low is, is basically is being born at this at this moment. When when you realize that this conjugate density must be quadratic in the in the argument, and then you use this uh, use this uh, this fact uh, along with the limit n to zero to determine a self consistency equation for this constant. So now all all we have. All we have to do is to putting all the pieces uh, pieces together, and but in essence, you will see that the semicircle is already in in uh, in here. Okay. So I think I only have uh, well maybe yeah, just uh, ten minutes, seven minutes to to finish. Uh, we can we can finish uh, next time. Before. Sorry, no. I would, meaning that I should not never finish, or <laughs> or that I should finish now. <laughs> it's hard to interpret, but either, <laughs> okay. Uh, can I can, can I leave it there? It was imperative. Sorry. You want? Sorry. Coffee. Coffee. Yeah. So so you want me to stop now? Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> we just wasted five five more minutes. Okay, see you on uh, whenever. I'm always upstairs. Wait, 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 wait! Matteo needs to speak. <laughs>